other one is Jenny Deering, and they have exactly the same frame, they're the same size. Uh, the frames are particularly interesting, and I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, she married uh, Thomas Wharton, who, uh, from whom uh, uh, Walpole, Robert Walpole, bought this pair of pants. And I was just talking with Paul, and he suggests that they were acquired in 1725 when uh, Wharton died. But I would maintain that they're in frames that are 1680s and still have the ball full press on them. So I had a, a colleague come down from Williamstown, who's a great frame expert, to talk about these. And then since then, I've talked to a, a Dutch conservator and my colleague at the Met, and I'll talk to another person at the tape. We talked about this frame and its <coughs> dull look and its uh, matte appearance, and when I mentioned that there was no burn maybe no burnishing on that original uh, Dutch frame, I'm talking about this, this kind of thing going on here. So do you know about, about gilding and the gilding process? I know a lot of you do, but you have, you have your your wood, and you have your gesso, which is calcium carbonate, whiting, and rabbit skin. rabbit skin glue, which comes, used to come like this, and you break that up and you soak it in water, and the, the, you know, they've alleged it comes from bunnies, but I think it's probably come from cows for a long time now. Um, um, but it's a, it's a high strength, fairly well processed, and first run, it's like extra virgin glue. You know, it's, it's really pretty good stuff. Um, and you mix that with the whiting and you paint it on. And then different colors of clay. Sometimes you'll have a, a yellow base clay, which again is clay mixed with rabbit skin glue, brushed on. Uh, this would help you hide uh, cracks in your gold leaf because it's yellow. If they didn't quite match down in a crevice, yeah, you wouldn't notice. Then wherever you want to burnish, you would put the red clay on. And here's a a chunk of red clay, so you would grind that up with your rabbit skin glue, or you would buy it in a jar already ground, and add your rabbit skin glue mix to it. So, you know, a tablespoon of this, a couple of tablespoons of your glue mix here, da -da 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 -da, and that gives you your red. Then you apply your gold leaf by flooding the surface with water and lifting the leaf on there with a gilder's tip, which is a brush, like, no, here's a, here's a, kind of like, like that, and um, you get a little oil from your face, or if you grow cream from your hair, or I put a little Vaseline on my arm and get it, and you can pick up a leaf and drop it on that wet surface, and the surface tension of the water will suck that leaf down on, and if you've done it right, nice and flat, no, no wrinkles or anything and it'll settle down on that clay, reactivate the glue in the clay, harden, and if you come back to it before it's hardened completely, you can burnish it with an agate and get that reflective surface. So you have matte surfaces and you have burnished surfaces, and you can do a whole lot on a picture frame by having matte and burnished passages. Um, you, can, you, can, you can stamp surfaces, you can do all kinds of things with it. But basically, if you've seen the, the gold ballroom, the Solana Marble House, uh, you'll see what I was talking about with glazes and tones, because if that room was just matte gilding, you wouldn't even know what it looked like. But it's not just matte, it's burnished, it's matte, it's gilded on raw wood, it's gilded on heavy gesso buildup, it's got black, red, and green glazes on it. It's very theatrical and there's a huge process to making all that stuff jump out. And that's really more of a theatrical work. And it gets more and more and more and more bold as you go up because the further away you get, the more relief you need to see. And so you'll find more glaze when you go way up high. There's just red glaze and stuff all over the place because they know that, that it needs to have that. So it's two miles of this stuff that's been drawn thin, rolled flat, dipped in silver, electroplated with gold, put on a spool, and then wrapped around using some machine, because this is late 19th century, making miles and miles and miles and miles of this stuff. You made where? 
they also did. You know, a I think in, I think France, and I, it would have been part of the trimming trade. And I, I cannot. Well, I haven't devoted myself, but if I talk to the head guy at Prell, he might be able to tell me where the factories were, where the trimming people got all this stuff. So the passementerie, all of that stuff, the gilded thread, the specialty weaving stuff came from another branch of the of the supply line. Um, and I don't know too much about that. Um, if you look at these, at the way that the gilded threads are popping out of the cut velvet, you'll see that so these there are... There was something over top of this. Well, so it was the, it woven into... Okay. The gilded threads were woven into the fabric, and when you look at them uh, really closely, you'll see that they're held in there with individual little loops of silk. Well, Unbelievable. that's like a saw. You know, as soon as that thing starts moving around, it, it's going right through that little silk. So they were popping out from the very, just coming out of the, of the, of the weave from the <coughs> very beginning. And so, you know, we have one room where we have a great reproduction, a great copy, and now we're preserving the original because we think that's important too, in all of its degradation. So we're, we're sewing, getting these things as parallel as we can, sewing them back down, and putting a, uh, a uh, not a crepe lean because it doesn't last, but a synthetic netting over it to just hold it, keep it protected from housekeeping and so on. We're doing, a, you can see behind you, we're actually printing our own infill material. So when we need to make a patch, we're actually doing it with Photoshop. We're taking a picture, we're fiddling with it, we're printing out our own textile using a pigment printer, um, which we didn't do the first time. We thought we had secure inks, but they turned out to be fugitive. So we're having to backtrack on a couple of chairs. We're here at the Newport Art Museum with Patrick Grimes, and you are the director? The artistic director, yeah. Artistic director, and we just filmed a little bit behind the scenes of the, uh, what is it, you call it the murder? Murder at the museum, but we do different scripts, and the current script is called Something Wicked This Way Comes, which is based on Shakespeare's Macbeth, obviously. However, it, it's set in the 1890s with, um, an amateur filmmaking endeavor by some of Newport's elite. And so um, you have roughly, what, eight or so actors? In the current cast, I think we have eight, yep. Eight actors, and then uh, you said to me earlier that they're playing dual roles somehow? Right, so they're all playing a character from the 1890s that was a real factual human being. Like, we have Astors, um, we've got uh, the Griswolds, we've got Ogden Gallette and his daughter May. Um, and so all of these actors are playing characters who are then characters in Macbeth. So Ogden Gallette has two characters in Macbeth that he has to play during the course. He has costume changes and whatnot. We don't get terribly far before someone actually dies. And at that point we have to cease production on the movie and move forward with figuring out who the murderer is. And we don't want to give away too much of the story because we would like people to come and see your production here at... Yeah, but, you know, it's a murder mystery, so you got to figure someone's going to die. Okay, someone's going to die. So then, um, it's, you have a lot of audience participation at this point? Yeah, the, the whole thing is completely interactive. So when the audience arrives, it's not like they're an audience. And that's never the way it is with us. Um, we believe that theater is meant to be experienced as opposed to witnessed. And so... I can't really think of a show we've done recently that had a fourth wall in it, that divider between the characters and the audience. In fact, we do everything completely interactive, where we invite them to be a part of it in this show by searching for clues and questioning the characters in the play. So once the person dies, we split all the suspects up throughout the museum. And the audience gets to look around for you know, paper clues, physical clues, like you know, maybe they can find the murder weapon. Um, and then they find characters all around with whom they can chat and ask questions about what's going on. So then, some of these pieces I see here on this table are some props. Yeah. Are some of the props. Yeah. And this is one of the rooms that is open for people to come in. And of course, they're not supposed to touch the exhibits. <laughs> yes, but, it is still a um, museum, so. Show me this great uh, movie camera, would you? Oh, would you? <laughs> yeah, we built ourselves. You know, silent movie cameras are not only hard to come by, but incredibly expensive when you do find one. Right. And so I pieced together some parts, including an old suitcase, um, Actually, this crank was a Lazy Susan pencil holder. 
that I've turned upside down. Um, this is an actual 35 millimeter film canister on top from an old projector. Some kind of a pipe fitting with a light socket inside of it? Uh, no, it's, it's, a, it's an actual lens, but it's from a projector. Uh, we have several digital projectors and, and the, the bulbs all come with lenses and when the bulb burns out the rest of that piece is garbage. So I cut it all apart and pulled out the glass lens. I uh, used a floor flange, a rubber fitting. Let's talk a little bit more about the show. Yeah. The show runs, what, so about an hour and a half? Yes, yeah, it's, it's 90 minutes from start to finish. And then roughly, very quickly, you get into the audience participation. Well, from the minute they walk in, they're greeted by characters and the, the sort of behind the scenes setting the time period and establishing our characters happens from the moment people come in to the museum. Uh, then we have our about 25 minutes of exposition where we sit everyone down in the main gallery and the show starts. And then once the person dies, that's when the audience has to really get involved. And it uses um, open, exhibit, open exhibit rooms in yep. the museum. Yep. And, um, Obviously, certain things they can touch, certain things they can't. Yeah, and we have actors everywhere to, to help guide people in the direction they need to go. So not only might I be a suspect, but I might also be there to help facilitate the, the moving of the story from there forward. So when people come and they start asking me questions, I could just clam up and not answer, but that's not any fun. Right. So I'll answer a few questions, and then they might ask me something that I can then send them to someone else to find the answer for. Like, well, you know, you have to ask Mr. Astor about that. I don't handle the money. And so that helps get people from one place to the next, and helps give them ideas on what other questions they can ask. And so, I mean, obviously people come because they're, they're into it and they want to yeah. want the ex experience. But the thing is, we find that there are some people who would rather be on the fringes, and they'll let other people question. So they might stand in the corner of a room and just listen to what goes on, take their notes and leave. So you can really be, it offers the opportunity to be as involved as you want. As much or as little as you want. Yeah. And then, um, without giving it away, um, how does it come to fruition? Well, after we've done the search and questioning, that usually brings up more questions that we then want all of the suspects back in the main room for. So we bring everyone back down, and the audience gets a chance to ask questions of people with everyone present, as opposed to with just the one person present. And so stories then can be found out to be wrong or not matching. And at that point, you might discover there's a liar. Uh, eventually, we'll let everyone vote on who they think did it. And then, after the vote, a murder is revealed. Uh -huh. Sometimes they get it right, sometimes not. Okay, great. Yeah. It sounds really very, very intriguing. And I hope that people take the time to come out and see you. It, it is a hoot. Every Saturday night? Yeah, and there's some Thursdays. Some Thursdays? Yeah, some Thursdays for Winterfest and school vacation. Uh, once we get into summer, then we'll be rotating scripts. So every other Saturday will be a different script. So we'll have an 1890s, and then a 1920s, and then back to 1890s. Um, right. And they can find all this info on the yeah, right on our website, newportmurdermystery.org website, or on newportmurdermystery.com. Oh, great! Okay, yeah. newportmurdermystery.com. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Pastor. You're welcome. My pleasure. A hoot. Yeah. Cut. Comes the rolling rack of theatrical costumes. Where did these costumes come from? They're all made by our costumer, who, um, of all things, has his degree in vocal opera performance, his master's. But he also has a great talent for period pieces, so spends hours and hours. I'd say each dress is probably 40 hours of work. <laughs> This is Macbeth. Indeed you do. Who, do people have specific roles that they usually play, so they're used to them, or do you guys switch it around to make it... it no, it's, it's all set. Yeah. And actually in the program that we give to the audience, it has their character name, and then their character's character name. So instead of John, it's George Griswold as... No, you're, no. you're Ogden Gallet. Yeah. Whatever he is. Ogden Gallet as... Who you play Doctor and Macduff. Does it matter to you which side the piano is on? If it's stage right, I'm afraid it's going to be blocking the door. Well, I thought we could move it further over, unless that's... For the cord to reach, it's got to be pretty close to the wall. Well, we thought we would tuck it in that corner. 
Do we do that on the other side with the exit to the stairs? Um, I don't know. No idea. I don't think it matters necessarily which right. side it's on. You what? We thought it would just be on the other side of the thing, and then we wouldn't even have to cross the court ever. It was just a snap decision to switch it to that side tonight. Is that heavy? Who's Lennox? Oh, yes, me. Batman, you are uh, George Griswold. You're right. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my God. 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 Oh, Oh, excuse me, Clive. I don't care, just get on with it. 
Are we are we all set to do the witch? Live oh, everybody! Oh,
speak, Lucy. Speak.